Hello and welcome at Fernando AGP in the UK. Today, we're going to do a quick up-to-date review of the NICE guidelines on the diagnosis and management of chronic heart failure in adults, including the visual summary flowcharts, always focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. Right, so let's jump into it. And we start with a diagnosis. We will take a detailed history and examination and we will consider the following investigations to exclude other potential conditions. An ECG, a chest X-ray, blood tests, including a full blood count, renal, liver and thyroid function tests, a lipid profile and HbA1c, urinalysis and a peak flow or spirometry. And if we suspect heart failure, we will measure the internal pro-B type natriuretic peptide which from now on we will refer to as NT-proBNP. High levels of NT-proBNP carry a poor prognosis. For this reason, if the levels are very high, that is above 2,000 nanograms per litre or 236 picomoles per litre, we will refer them urgently to have specialist assessment and a transthoracic echocardiogram within two weeks. However, if the levels are only moderately high, that is between 400 and 2,000 nanograms per litre, or 47 to 236 picomoles per litre, we will refer them also urgently, but to be seen within six weeks. We also need to be aware that an nt pro BNP level less than 400 nanograms per litre, or 47 picomoles per litre, in an untreated person, makes heart failure less likely, so we should consider alternative courses and refer if in doubt. The nt pro BNP level does not differentiate between heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Let's remember that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is usually associated with impaired left ventricular relaxation rather than left ventricular contraction, so it has normal left ventricular ejection fraction and evidence of diastolic dysfunction. Whereas the opposite is true for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, when the ejection fraction is below 4%. The nt pro BNP level can be reduced in obesity, African or African Caribbean family origin, or drugs such as diuretics, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, and mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, or MRAs. Conversely, the nt pro BNP level can be high due to other reasons such as, for example, age over 70 years, left ventricular hypertrophy, ischemia, tachycardia, right ventricular overload, hypoxemia like in PE and COPD, EGFR less than 60, sepsis, diabetes and liver cirrhosis. The purpose of initial transthoracic echocardiogram is to exclude valve disease, assess left ventricular function and detect intracardiac shunts. However, alternative cardiac imaging can be considered if the transthoracic images are poor. Finally, if a patient with a pre-existing diagnosis of heart failure has not been fully investigated in the past, then we should arrange the appropriate investigations in order to confirm the diagnosis. NICE has produced a usual visual summary covering the diagnosis of chronic heart failure in the form of a flowchart. Let's have a look at it. If we suspect chronic heart failure, we will take a full history and examination. And then we will investigate by measuring the nt pro BNP level and by performing alternative investigations such as an ECG, a chest X-ray, blood tests, urinalysis and peak flow or spirometry. If the nt pro BNP levels are very high, we will refer to specialist services urgently to be seen within two weeks. If the nt pro BNP levels are only moderately high, we will refer to specialist services also urgently, but to be seen within six weeks. And this specialist assessment should also include a transthoracic echocardiogram. If the nt pro BNP levels are not high, then we will consider alternative diagnoses and we will get specialist input if in doubt. Finally, if heart failure is confirmed on an echocardiogram, then we will assess the severity and possible causes as well as correctable factors. 
Let's now have a look at the treatment. I will start with the management that is applicable to all forms of heart failure, that is both heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But we need to be aware that there are specific recommendations for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction that I will cover later. So, for all types of heart failure, diuretics should be used for the relief of congestive symptoms and fluid retention and are treated up and down according to need. A low to medium dose of loop diuretics, for example, no more than 80 mg of frusemide per day, should be used in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. As a general recommendation, we will avoid verapamil, daltasem, and short acting dehydropyridine agents, such as nifedipine, in people who have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Amiodarone should be initiated by a specialist only, and if a patient is in sinus rhythm, anticoagulation should be considered for those with a history of thromboembolism, left ventricular aneurysm, or intracardiac thrombus. In terms of non pharmacological treatment, Flu and pneumococcal vaccinations are recommended. In women of childbearing potential, contraception and pregnancy should be discussed, and the patient preferred if pregnancy is being considered or it occurs. We will not routinely advise sodium or fluid restriction, but we will restrict fluids if there is dilutional hyponatremia, and we will advise reducing salt intake if it is excessive. We should also advise against salt substitutes that contain potassium. Air travel will be possible for most patients and we should follow the DVLA guidelines in terms of driving. So let's now have a look at the specific treatment for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, that is when the left ventricular function is below 40%. As first-line treatment, we will offer an inhibitor and a beta blocker licensed for heart failure using clinical judgment when deciding which drug to start first. If an ACE inhibitor is not tolerated, we will substitute it with an ARP licensed for heart failure. Currently, the beta blockers licensed for heart failure in the UK are bisoprolol, carvedilol, and epivolol. And currently, the ARBs licensed for heart failure in the UK are candesartan, losartan, and valsartan. But we will not offer ACE inhibitors if there is a clinical suspicion of hemodynamically significant mild disease until seen by a specialist first. In terms of beta blockers, we will not withhold them solely because of age or the presence of peripheral vascular disease, erectile dysfunction, diabetes, interstitial pulmonary disease or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Also, if a patient develops heart failure, we will switch people who are already taking a beta blocker for something else, for example angina or hypertension, to a beta blocker licensed for heart failure. After this, we will offer a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist or MRA, such as paranolactol, in addition to an ACE inhibitor or ARB and a beta blocker, if they continue to have symptoms. When prescribing ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers and MRAs, we will start at a low dose and titrate upwards at short intervals, for example every two weeks until the target or maximum tolerated dose is reached. We will measure sodium and potassium and assess renal function before and one well to two weeks after starting on this inhibitor, ARB or MRA, and after each dose increment. We will measure blood pressure before and after each dose increment, and in addition, we will assess the heart rate when given beta blockers. Once the target or maximum tolerated dose is reached, we will monitor the treatment monthly for three months and then at least every six months and at any time that the person becomes acutely unwell. As well as ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers and MRAs, there are a number of other drugs that can be given for heart failure by a heart failure specialist. These are dapagliflozin and empagliflozin, evapradin, sacubitril plosartan, hydronacin in combination with nitrates, and digoxin. We will give the same treatment to people who have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and chronic kidney disease, but if the EGFR is between 30 and 45, we will consider lower doses and or slower titration of ACE inhibitors, ARBs, MRAs and digoxin 
monitoring closely and taking into account the increased risk of hyperkalemia. If the EGFR is below 30, we will liaise with a renal physician. Monitoring treatment for all types of heart failure should include a clinical assessment, a review of medication and an assessment of renal function. Monitoring potassium is particularly important if a patient is on digoxin or an MRA. The frequency of monitoring depends on the clinical situation and stability of the person. The monitoring intervals should be short, days to two weeks, if the clinical condition or medication has changed, but it's needed at least six monthly for patients who are stable. We will consider measuring nt BNP for monitoring purposes only in a specialist care setting. A cardiac rehabilitation program should be offered unless the condition is unstable. And in terms of palliative care, we will not offer long-term home oxygen therapy for heart failure alone. And just like for the diagnosis, NICE has produced through visual summary covering the management of chronic heart failure in the form of a flowchart. Let's have a look at it. Once chronic heart failure has been diagnosed, we can use diuretics for congestive symptoms and fluid retention. And then, any further treatment will depend on the type of heart failure. If it is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we will simply manage comorbidities such as hypertension, AF, ischemic heart disease and diabetes. And we will offer a cardiac rehabilitation program unless the condition is unstable. On the other hand, if it is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we will offer an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker as first-line treatment, followed by an MRA if symptoms persist. And we can give an ARP if the patient cannot tolerate an ACE inhibitor because of side effects. And we will do this as well as offering cardiac rehabilitation unless the condition is unstable. If that is not enough, then we move to specialist referral for reassessment and consideration of other forms of treatment. So if symptoms persist, despite first-line treatment, specialist services may consider one or more of the following options. Replacing the ACE inhibitor IARB by sacrobutyl valsartan, or adding evabradine, or adding hydralazine and nitrate, which can also be considered if ACE inhibitors and ARBs are not tolerated at an earlier stage, and adding digoxin. And finally, although it does not appear on this flowchart, SGLT2 inhibitors such as dapagliflozin and impagliflozin are now recommended for both heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, so there could be another option here for specialist services. And that is it, a quick summary of the NICE guideline on chronic heart failure. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice, and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.